on this episode of China Unscripted, how China is working with the Taliban and using the fall of Afghanistan against the U.S. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Chong. And I'm Matt Ganeshda. And joining us once again is Captain Jim Fennell, former director of intelligence and information operations for the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Jim, great to have you back on. It's great to be back. Thank you for inviting me again. Well, you know, it's it's obviously not the the, the greatest uh, scenario to have you back in. I mean, as a military man yourself, how do you feel about the whole uh, Afghanistan debacle, fiasco, cluster? Uh, well, well, how do you feel about leaving it? Afghanistan? Leaving Afghanistan? We're still there. No, we are still there. Yeah, we have uh, at least ten thousand. American citizens who are being held hostage, and what did the president say? 55, 60,000 uh, friends of uh, Afghanis that have helped us over the years. So it's really, uh, it's really hard to watch uh, to see that uh, that that people are actually, you know, being murdered and raped and killed uh, based on a decision that was hard to imagine. That the decision was based on a, a time, you know, a, a date on a calendar. Well, we want to get everybody out before the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and therefore we can make some political points. If political points was the goal, that's backfired. Yeah, exactly. It, it, that's, a, that's really what's even more devastating about it is that the, I think the decision to, to do this was based on a political time, you know, to give them this benefit of saying they did something and it's completely backfired. And the result of it is, is literally people are being murdered and killed and raped and hunted down. And uh, people, and people have, you know, that have never known the Taliban, people that are less than 20 years old, maybe you're only 25 years old even, and you weren't even alive when they were running things and you known freedom and openness for your whole life. And all of a sudden now you're, you're running for your life. Uh, it's it's dramatic. And to think that this was done by so-called the experts in foreign policy that were going to, you know, restore America's foreign policy credibility after the, you know, the, the last administration, which was accused of being so inept. It's just really shocking. Well, Jim, you focus a lot on, you know, the, the murder and the rape and the hunting people down. But China says it's looking forward to, you know, friendly relations with the Taliban and the Taliban creating an open and inclusive society. Yeah. It's amazing the amount of, uh, if I went back through our, my list of emails in the Red Star Rising before this uh, show and was just kind of scanning through and looking for articles about the Chinese talking about Afghanistan. And it's clear that Chinese uh, Communist Party, the foreign ministry, Foreign Minister Wang Yi, they had been working this before this debacle. They had been meeting with the Taliban in, in, in China and talking with them and, and laying the seeds for how they could come in and portray themselves as a mediator and that they're going to you know, hold the Taliban to give up their violent ways, but see them as a potentially a legitimate uh, representative of the people of Afghanistan. And it's just uh, sickening because it was all laid out there for us to see, you know, China's maneuvering and activity behind the scenes. And uh, I guess we just didn't care about that. It, I mean, it's, it's crazy to me. Like you hear the Chinese Communist Party talking about working with the Taliban. At the same time, they're talking about going after terrorists in Hong Kong, students and teachers. It's, it's right. bizarro. And they sure that in their pronouncements, uh, Tinjan, they said, you know, we would, you know, we want to work with the Taliban. We can help negotiate these things. And, uh, you know, they have to give up their violent ways. And they also have to disassociate themselves from ETIM and because we're going to go after them and wipe them out in, in, in Western China. But uh, it, it's just amazing that the amount of uh, maneuvering that they've, the PRC's already done in this arena while we appear to be, uh, you know, completely f flat-footed or just cutting and running. You mentioned, Jim, the ETIM, so that's East Turkestan Independence Movement. Islamic. Or sorry. East Turkestan Islamic, Islamic Movement. Movement. What, what, what is that, Jim? And how do you see the, the Chinese Communist Party potentially working with the Taliban to go after that group? 
Oh, this is the, the, the Uyghurs out in Western China, the people that have, you know, kind of said we want to, you know, we want to be separate and, and have kind of our ethnic identity. And, and the Chinese government has said, no, you're a terrorist organization and you're part of the, I forget, they have a, a list of the, of, the, of, of the things that they're against and terrorism and extremism. This group has been identified as that. And so we've watched them put, you know, Uyghurs in concentration camps and we've watched them gather them up and, and and we don't know exactly everything that they've done, but from the stories that we hear, <laughs> they're murdering and raping there as well. And so now they've got a deal with the government, uh, an emerging potential government of, of Afghanistan run by a, uh, a Taliban organization that may or may not have similar views uh, to the people of, of Xinjiang and the Uyghurs. It probably don't have the same, but I mean, are considered, you, you could understand that the Chinese Communist Party could look at the Taliban and say, well, you're an extremist organization, but they're willing to work with them to go after and help them uh, exterminate the, the Uyghurs, uh, separatists uh, that they think are inside China. So what they'll probably do is tell the Taliban, hey, we'll leave you alone. We won't come in and bother you as long as you make sure that anybody that comes out of China uh, from that's Uyghur that tries to set up camp in your neighborhoods, that you turn them over to us or exterminate them and show us proof of that. It's crazy to me that, like, you know, the, China is committing genocide on Muslims, and yet it's trying to work with the Taliban. And frankly, no other Muslim-majority country seems to be all that concerned with the Muslim genocide in China. Right. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I mean, some would argue maybe that the Taliban, yes, they follow a Sharia you know what vein of Mus Mus of the Muslim culture and the Muslim religion are they? I mean, it's a very it's a very extreme one. Uh, so, I'm sure that the Chinese will be able to somehow differentiate that and 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 you know divide that up and salami slice it to be able to make uh, some kind of political uh, uh, agreement. And they've already said over and over again, you know, if the if the Taliban gives up its uh, you know terroristic ways, then we'll be able to work with them and. So far, the Taliban spokespeople have all been on cue to make sure that they say the right things, similar to what they said back uh, right after 9-11. Uh, but this time they've got 20 years of experience using, uh, you know, social media and, 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 and the Internet and things of that nature. So I'm sure they're going to be much more uh, sophisticated in how they portray themselves, at least until they get uh, what they want, which is to get the Americans out first and foremost. Matt, I want to go back to ETIM for a second because there is some independent research that shows that this group might actually not even exist anymore. But it is the primary group that the Chinese Communist Party uses as a bo uh, as a boogeyman, basically, to talk about terrorism so, in Xinjiang. And that's what they use to lock up like literally 10% of the Uyghurs in concentration camps. It's a complicated story because they kind of, this was, the, there was like this group of Uyghurs who traveled to Afghanistan in the 90s, in the mid 90s. And they were kind of like a like a small independence movement kind of thing, but they were not violent jihadists. And they tried to get support from the Taliban and nobody really cared about their cause, essentially. And they kind of essentially the the original group petered out in the mid 2000s when the first uh, the leader of that group died and he had actually even called radio free asia after the september 11th attacks to denounce them and say we're not working with the taliban we're not working with al qaeda uh, and it was interesting because this the chinese communist party essentially used this group and this was the group they got put on the terror list by the george w bush administration uh, in order to get China to support the war on terror, the CCP was like, okay, but you have to add this Uyghur group to your terrorist list. And at first, the Bush administration actually wasn't happy with what the Chinese Communist Party was doing because they essentially, um, I think even President Bush said something about how the war on terror shouldn't be used by the Chinese to like go after their own ethnic minorities. And then when they were trying to get Right before the U.S. invaded Iraq, they kind of made a made a turn and actually put ETIM 
on this terrorist list? I feel like this is a lesson for what happens when you say we have to work with China to tackle blank. Mm -hmm. And then they, they find a way to manipulate it towards their own means. And essentially what the Chinese Communist Party has done is that they have come up with this list of so-called hundreds of quote unquote terrorist activities. And in the 80s and 90s, there were some bus bombings in uh, Xinjiang. There were some violent acts. But the most of most of the things on their list are things like knife attacks that we've done episodes on that we know happens in other parts of China. It's not something that's, you know, there's not really a jihadist movement. There's not really any kind of like organized terrorism movement in Xinjiang at all. They're just using this to genocide the Uyghurs. But, you know, we kind of fell for it until last year, Pompeo actually removed ETIM from the terrorist list. Hmm. Oh, man, I think it's funny what you said, like, oh, yeah, we have to work with China. Yeah, we have to work with China on the war on terror. And now they're supporting the Taliban. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. I mean, it took 20 years. It took 20 years. Well, so, Jim, this this is the big question. You know, a few weeks before this all went down, uh, China met with Taliban officials. What do you think they talked about? What do you think? Did China have a role in what happened in Afghanistan? What was that meeting about? I think it was uh, China seeing the, I mean, knowing that the United States, this administration and the previous administration and the previous and the previous had said they wanted to get out. And now we had kind of this firmer timetable that the, the Biden administration had put out there of the time. You know, the, the, the exact thing I think that President Trump had said when he was president is you don't tell your adversaries when you're going to do something to allow them to maneuver and take advantage of you. So didn't he set a deadline for American withdrawal? I, yeah, they had said that was, was September 11th is what they wanted. to. No, the, no, Trump the Trump administration, administration had said, I believe, May 1st, 2021. But they said that it was on conditions and that they and they had already delayed it back a few times uh, over the course of that year. Um, and so in this case, what I think the Chinese knew was that there was a larger framework of a timeline that America was committed to leaving. So in, that, in a strategic sense, it didn't matter what day it was in the calendar. They knew that both the Republican and Democrat administration were committed to this because the American people, I think most polls had said, you know, majority of American people, great majority, wanted us to get out after 20 years. So China knew that. And so they had been laying the seeds with these kinds of discussions. And then I think when the Biden administration came out and said, hey, we're going to have everybody out by September 11th, I think the Chinese uh, took advantage of that in the sense that they brought the Taliban uh, to China and said, hey, how can, how can we make this advantageous to you? How can we help you uh, get recognition as, uh, as the new legitimate government of, uh, of, uh, of Afghanistan with this probably sub-hidden thing of, well, by the way, if we help you, you've got to do this for us. And what's that laundry list of things that China gave to the Taliban? It's not just help with ETIM. I'm sure it's also some kind of arrangement for access to uh, these rare earth uh, uh, elements and minerals and lithium and things of that nature. I'm sure that's on there. How that plays out in the next uh, year or two is going to be interesting to watch. It's interesting because the Taliban has also said that they welcome Chinese development, essentially. That was one of the things that they talked about. They welcome Chinese development opportunities in Afghanistan. And China's had some trouble with their uh, development in Afghanistan so far. Like they've, they have two major projects in Afghanistan, both of which have had huge issues and are not very successful. Uh, so it's interesting to see whether the Taliban will actually be able to get more Chinese investment. I think that's the, that's exactly, Shelley, the, the challenge, which is to say they've had these problems in the past, but now if China comes in and becomes this kind of unseen benefactor, if you will, that's maneuvering behind the scenes and helps the Taliban uh, help negotiate a, some kind of financial deal with the United States, because I don't think this administration is going to do what, uh, what you know many of us would think what should be done, which is to roll back in there with massive amount of military force and physically rescue our people. That's not going to happen, probably. And so how do we get our people out? Well, somebody's going to have to pay. Just like the Iran nuclear deal, there's probably going to be some kind of payment made. And so China's probably negotiating with the Taliban to help them 
and get as much as they can. And then for every amount of help that China makes in that effort, they're going to ask the Taliban to say, listen, we don't want to occupy you. We don't want anything else. We just want to do business. And part of that business is for us to be able to set up a few, you know, uh, ore and mining camps or whatever it is and have this road that goes through that, com- you know, connects the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Uh, you got to help us on that. And, and, and if you don't, you know, then we're going to have some problems. But they won't say those kind of uh, negative things up front. What they'll just say is this can be a win-win situation. You can get we can help you negotiate with the United States and get as much as you want. And you can help us by making sure that when we do have some investments there, uh, that you're not allowing them to be destroyed by, you know, people that, like they've done in the past. I think that's where China may be mistaken because we have hundreds of years of, of, of history of what happens in Afghanistan. And I don't I don't think the tribes are going to be controlled like that. But you never know. Well, so that's the interesting thing to me, because, I mean, maybe this is just because I have an American perspective and I don't think the Taliban is, you know, a trustworthy, great group of guys. But does China really think they can work with the Taliban without some kind of sudden but inevitable betrayal? I think I think when you read what, you know, the Chinese Communist Party writes about their form of global governance and the way that they think that they can maneuver uh, and that their superior form, uh, there's going to be an element in China, uh, an arrogant element that's going to say, listen, we're better. We're better than the Russians. We're better than the Brits. We're better than the Americans who came in with a hammer. And we can come in with our comprehensive national power and we can ex- we can use soft power and we can use information and we can use money and uh, we can make this a win-win. And if we can do this, comrades, they'll say, they then this will be the final coup de grace uh, that'll show that our form of governance is superior to Western uh, liberal democracy. And I think that argument's probably being uh, discussed inside the great halls in, in, in Beijing. And so I think that's really the challenge is, uh, you know, can they pull that off? And my look at history says it's going to be a, it, it's, it's a, it's a gamble because uh, the Taliban is not a, a single entity there. It's a, it's a tribal uh, a communal organization or a, a society. Each area has its own tribal ruler and, and they're not all equal and they don't all obey each other. And so uh, how does China, how does China get in and, and do that? Do, do they, you know, send their diplomats into each area and try to establish relations. Well, America tried that over the last 20 years, uh, and it didn't really work so well. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, but I think China will be able to offer uh, the Taliban, like they do in many other places, this kind of, uh, I'll give you all this with any, without strings attached. I mean, up front, you know, it'll be, I'll give you 10 million bucks or 10 billion bucks and you don't have to pay me any interest for five years or 10 years and then see how things go after five or 10 years. And then if the stability comes, then the Chinese can start putting on, you know, uh, you know, give me a little bit more here. Give me a little bit more. Oh, now we need one point one percent, you know, interest or whatever it is. And so that'll be the challenge to see how they do that. So I think they're going to try that because they need to have a buffer and, and they're constantly concerned about. The buffering of their nation, they feel like they're surrounded, they feel like they're encircled. So this would give them a, another buffer in a, in a geographical sense. They also have the Belt and Road and this economic uh, Silk Road that they want to build. And this would be another great way to help cement uh, some of that into existence. I don't expect we're going to see Chinese military rolling in there in tanks or in air, aircraft anytime soon. I just don't think the Chinese are that they're not going to do that. They're, they've seen enough now in 20 years that they know that they cannot do that. So they're going to try to do it through other methods. It'll be the typical kind of Belt and Road colonization that we're seeing around the world in Afghanistan. Right. And what will challenge that will be the Taliban's response. You know, the, to them, this may be something that they've never experienced before, because before everybody's come in with an, an AK-47 or an M-16 and shoved it in their face and said, obey. So if somebody comes in with a box of cash and says, I give you cash, you give me rocks, uh, maybe that works. 
And that, and to what you said earlier, that would be a way for China to say, like, look, all of these other empires failed in Afghanistan, but we win because we use our own, you know, specific uh, ch- socialism with Chinese characteristics. Win win mutual cooperation. It's a, they're going to sell it as a win win. The question becomes the PRC and, and the, the Communist Party has this penchant for <laughs> total control. And so, you know, are they going to be able to uh, accept uh, working with a partner that's, you know, doesn't have the same kind of uh, standards for control? I mean, we know in Xinjiang, the Chinese have installed, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of cameras and, and sensors, and, and nobody can move around without the party's command centers watching people and facial recognition. Uh, I don't think the Chinese Communist Party wants to do that in Afghanistan, but they're going to want to have some form of of awareness of what's going on, I think. And it's going to be hard for them uh, to, to get that because the Taliban won't want that. Well, I wouldn't be too surprised if the Taliban wouldn't mind having under their control some of that Chinese surveillance, like to be able to monitor the people of Afghanistan a little more. How about... They, you know, the Chinese invest money to make Kabul a Huawei smart city. There Um, you go. Yeah. I mean, don't give them any help. (laughs) Yeah, quiet, man. That's actually just, that's what they're probably doing. That's probably not the problem, though. It's like what happens in the areas where they're going to be building their mines, right? Yeah. Like. Well, well, so yeah, Jim, you made a good point about how, like, the Taliban isn't like a single unified thing. Because in Pakistan... The Pakistani Taliban has actually carried out terrorist attacks on uh, several Chinese projects there. So that's that's an example of how like this is not a, it's not like a country that China deals with previously. Well, and, and Chris, that that attack you just mentioned, it was on your show a, a night or two ago. You covered it. You know, when you watch the press from China, that didn't really get above the fold coverage. Hmm. It wasn't like they were harping on it. I mean, they'd harp more on. Uh, who's that doctor uh, in Germany, Adrian Zenz, and his coverage of the Uyghurs. I mean, they obsess about somebody like that and will cover that guy every day for 13 days or something, uh, or Pompeo's speech or something like that. They'll, they'll fixate on, and you know it's really bothering the party leaders. But this thing that happened in Pakistan, it was they covered it. They were upset, not happy, but it wasn't like a, a, a break with Pakistan. It was something that they said, okay, we're going to have to deal with this. Well, because it's, it's despite their whole wolf warrior diplomacy kind of thing, really, at the end of the day, all those attacks did was like, what, it killed one Chinese worker? The party doesn't care about the life of one Chinese citizen, as long as the overall development package with Pakistan is not actually being interfered with. Not unless you're the chief financial officer of Huawei in Canada. Oh. Then they care. Yeah, I mean, I I don't think they actually. I don't think the party cares about Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou. Like, I I think that what they're doing is they're using her as a political tool to uh, to test Canada and the U.S. and using them as uh, using it as a political tool to attack the U.S. and attack Canada and have an excuse to do other things to Canadians in China. So, like, they could just as easily bring Meng Wanzhou back to China. And then, you know, put her in the shuang like the, the party, you know, detention system. Look, look at what the Communist Party has done to so many, you know, wealthy or, or connected people is, you know, they just lock them up anyway. So it's not like the party cares about her as an individual. And I think party philosophy, you know, from the days of Mao is very clear that like, it's not a nation uh, where individual life is important. It's a nation where like you follow the party and the party is important. And if we have to sacrifice, what did Mao say? Like, if we lose half the population in nuclear war, it's not a big deal because, you know, we're a big country and we, you know, can make more people. I mean, it's just this kind well, of... Brutal- currently, they're not having a great time making more people. Oh, well, Mao didn't foresee that. Yeah. Well, I think with Meng, there's an extra thing about what does she know? And could they be afraid that she would try to cut some kind of deal with the Americans? Tell some of the Huawei secrets. Yeah. I mean, I think that's probably unlikely, but it's unlikely not that impossible. she would. Not unlikely that she knows, right? Right, unlikely that she would actually cut a deal, but it's not impossible. Yeah, she's she's probably better off in Canada under you know house arrest in her big beautiful mansion than going back to China at this point. But I think back to Afghanistan. Your point is, I, I agree. It's not the individual; it's the what it means that they will use an individual 
to make or break uh, a deal or make a position on something. And so in this case in Pakistan, one person was, one Chinese national was killed and it didn't have any really bearing on the overall uh, China-Pakistan relationship. I'm sure behind the scenes, there's probably a few harsh letters and calls and things of that nature. And I'm sure uh, Khan, uh, the, the, the prime minister of Pakistan, you know, said, hey, we're working it. Uh, and China will say, OK, got it. You know, as long as we have good faith effort that you're working it. And I think that kind of model is what you're going to see uh, play out in, in, in Afghanistan. Initially, uh, the, 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 the Afghan, uh, the Taliban is probably going to, you know, do their best to uh, uh, try to tamp down that kind of stuff. For, because for them, it's just a win win because they don't get they don't get troops in from China. So all they have to do is, you know, give up some rocks and they get a good price for them. And what do you think the Taliban will end up doing with all that Chinese money? Hmm. Wasting it like they have for the last 20 years of wasted American money. Uh, I mean, we poured, we poured trillions in there. And what's, what's become of it? There'll be some improvements. There'll probably be some local, uh, you know, hospitals made and the things of that nature, some improvement to roads and some uh, certainly mosques being built and things of that nature. But uh, and it'll be corruption. And that's that's kind of the way it runs there. Look at this guy that was just left, Ghani. They said he had one hundred and seventy six million or one hundred and sixty eight million dollars. And he would have got had more if his plane could have held it. So. Didn't China also, like just be- just a few weeks before they met the Taliban, didn't they also, did Xi Jinping meet with him? He called him. They called him, yeah. So th- it seemed like China was really trying to play all sides of this. Oh, yeah. That's what they do. And that's what most nations, great powers do, is that they're, they, they have this awareness of, of everything that's going on in, in a country like that. And they're trying to make sure that they cover, uh, they're, they're hedging their bets, if you will. Yeah, I mean, China hosted secret peace talks between the Taliban and the Afghan government back in 2015 in Xinjiang, in Urumqi. And it was kind of the first time they really inserted themselves into the Afghanistan situation. Well, you're saying that the Chinese Communist Party interfered in another country's internal affairs? They would never do that, Matt. You know, somebody pointed out on Twitter, and I think this is a good point, that China doesn't have a policy of not interfering in other countries' in affairs. They have a policy of saying they don't interfere <laughs> in other countries' internal affairs. And on that, they've been very consistent. Yes. So, Jim, what do you think the Communist Party's overall goal in the Middle East is? I think that they want to fill the vacuum that's going to be left by a, an America that's in retreat. They want to... Obviously, China has the number one concern for them is their internal security and the regime stability. But then part of that stability is required to, you know, they're expanding with the Belt and Road and this economic uh, development that they want to have around the world. And they have an engine. Their economy is an engine and their people are an engine. They have 1.4 billion people, so they need energy. And they have to import their energy, a, a lot of it. And so... Where's a lot of energy in the world? It's out in these areas. And so to be able to establish uh, kind of this, uh, you know, Silk Road through these areas and have diplomatic outposts where you're now seen as the the guy that people go to to kiss the ring and say, okay, what do you think we should do, China? Or can you help us invest here? China's going to, you know, seek to have that position. They've been doing that with Iran. They've even been reaching out to Saudi Arabia uh, and other places like this to get in, get inside this network and establish their own uh, net, if you will, to be able to have access and uh, relations, and then ultimately to be able to uh, use those for their advantage and to get uh, to get resources and energy. They need energy, and so this would be another way to do it. Even while they're working with Europe and America uh, with the Green New Deal and, and uh, climate change and, and going green. So on the one hand, they'll tell the Western world they're going green, but on the other hand, they're going to be working to get uh, fossil fuels because they'll, they're going to need them. We all need them. You know, that's the reality of that situation. We're not going to be able to just go you know, totally green as some people think that we can. And China knows that, and so they're going to continue to take advantage of that. Well, so you know, some people might say, Oh, China going into the Middle East to, you know, meet its energy needs and 
you know, establish relations there and try to be a, a dominant foreign force. They're like, what's wrong with that? Because America has been doing that for decades. Yeah, I, and that's a legitimate argument. And I, and many of us in America said, why were we doing that? <laughs> I, for most of my Navy career was, you know, saying we needed to focus our attention on the Chinese Communist Party and not, you know, divert our attention into the Middle East where we had the capability ourselves to be energy independent, in which the previous administration proved that uh, from the first time ever since, I mean, you guys were, not, none of you were born. You don't remember the, the energy oil crisis in the 70s and seeing people standing in line for gas and being at the, the mercy of OPEC. Uh, I remember that. I was, you know, not that old, but I still remember it. And uh, that was like 50 plus years ago. And so for 50 years, we've been under that sword of Damocles and, you know, we had an administration, the last one, come in and say, why are we doing that? Let's get out of the Middle East. Let's get out of our dependency. We have the natural resources that God gave us. Let's take advantage of it and, and use them here uh, and not be so dependent on uh, foreign nations. And, oh, by the way, let's not, you know, send our people into harm's way and have them be killed when we don't need to. And why? And, and on another more humane level, why should we be over there killing people from other countries for oil. I mean, it's just, it wasn't right. Uh, but that's what we did. And so now China's going to do that. The question is, how do they do it? And what are they going to do with all that power? And what are they going to do with all of those resources? And how are they going to, uh, what's, the, what's the quid pro quo with each of these nations? What do those nations have to do? Do they have to turn their backs on the United States at some point? Do they have to turn their backs on Israel? And will that unleash a some kind of war in the Middle East because now all of a sudden China says we don't want to support Israel? I don't know. But there's all many, many facets there. And so if another nation sticks their nose into it and starts trying to manipulate, the odds are historically that these cause controversies and disruptions and wars. So we have to be careful of that. My personal opinion is, is that, or feeling is, uh, I'm giving you my opinions, my feeling is, is that China wants this because it fits their model or their mindset of this, you know, they are the new superpower. It's the, the you know, Gordon Chang talks about Chen Jia and this all under heaven. They are the new rulers of the earth. That's what they really believe. And so they've got to have their, their network of diplomats and, and business people in all these countries and, and the relationships, and they need to be controlling things. They want to be the ones controlling the ebb and flow of commerce and, uh, and, and goods and services and, and establishing a new, a new order. And I think it's just natural that they do that. The question is, what does that mean for Americans? What does that mean for free people in other nations if you don't want to be part of that? And my fear is it's like what we're seeing in America and other places, Australia and New Zealand with this virus. You're not going to be left alone. You're not going to be left. You're not going to be allowed to be left alone and do what you want. Freedom is no longer uh, a commodity that seems uh, to be in uh, 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 valued anymore. We're, we're former government officials in the United States saying, "Screw your freedom, really? Screw the Constitution? Screw the 250 years of America?" Yeah, that's what we're seeing. That's where we're headed, and China's going to be pushing that, and that scares me. Do you think it was a mistake on the U.S.'s part to kind of invite China in to become a player in some of these regions? Not so much the Middle East, but I'm thinking Afghanistan, when China started getting involved with like the peace talks there, the U.S. you know, was kind of like, yeah, well, you know, we need more stakeholders in the situation. Or I'm reminded of like places like North Korea where, you know, we were like, oh, yes, the six party talks, we need to get China involved. Like, do you think it's a mistake to give China that type of global like recognition and like like treat them like they, they should be you know what to we treat think. them like they're the superpower they right. want or like we think oh we want them to be a responsible global actor and that means they're going to come in and but like they're going to be like us they're just going to be like the UK or France or Germany yeah it, it, it we have done we've talked about this I think the last time about this Kissinger school and the engagement community. And since uh, Kissinger made his trip to, to China, we have, and we switched our recognition, the dominant foreign policy view out of Washington has been, we must engage with China. We must engage with China. We must build bridges with them because 
the future of the world is dependent upon us having good relations. And, and initially it was so we could triangulate with them and, you know, keep Russia and the Soviet Union at bay. Uh, and then it morphed over the last 40 years into this, well, they're growing, they're 1.4 billion people. And if we don't engage with them, then there'll be an adversary and that'll be very dangerous for us. And we don't want that. And so we legitimize them through all these uh, invitations that you described, like the six party talks. And I would just, you know, ask, can anybody show me a place where inviting China into to be a third party or a fifth or sixth party into a negotiation that was in the U.S. national interest or the interest of one of our allies has ever worked out? None. I don't see anything that's worked out. Yeah. You could even say this Afghanistan event hasn't worked out. I mean, we have 10,000 people still on the ground. If China was really a, a, a legitimate superpower and a, and a you know, doing what they say they they do, peaceful development and helping other nations, then how come we still have ten thousand people there? They didn't help. They didn't help anything. And we may we may find out someday that they actually were were responsible for helping those ten thousand people be uh, held captive right now. That they told the Taliban, you know, your best move is to put a wire around the Kabul airport, a ring of steel, and not let anybody in. That's your best way to have leverage over the Americans. Who knows? We, we won't know that probably ever, but it's possible. I'm curious, Jim, what do you think this means for the U.S. military? Uh, well, last time we had you on, we talked about how, you know, back in 2000, uh, the U.S. was kind of gradually shifting its focus to the Asia Pacific. But then it got involved in the Middle East. The Navy took on a uh, support role for ground forces, uh, and that sort of allowed China's Navy to grow rapidly while the U.S. Navy kind of was a support role. Uh, Over the past few years, the military has again been focusing more heavily on the Indo-Pacific now. Do you think uh, that shift is at risk with new threats in the Middle East? I think right now with this administration, from everything that I've seen over the last uh, week here, with the president's statement and the uh, statements from the secretary of defense and uh, chairman, uh, there's, they're not going back in. So it seems very clear that this administration is committed to leaving no matter what the cost. So uh, we can, that's another probably podcast to discuss that, but that's, that's the message that they have sent. We're not going to risk any more American lives to save 10,000 Americans or 60,000 of our former Afghani friends. Uh, the implications of that are si- significant, but from a military perspective, do I see us all of a sudden, you know, ramping up like we did after 9-11 and, you know, going in with a full force and diverting military resources from the Pacific? Uh, I don't see that in the near term. I just don't see that as a possibility. But does that then de- mean that we're safe in the Pacific is probably the next question. And, and I don't think we're safe in the Pacific. If you recall, during the Obama administration, they came out uh, and the Navy said we would uh, have a 60-40 split. We would, 60% of the U.S. Navy would be in the Pacific and 40% in the Atlantic. It was always theoretically 50-50. And I remember talking to some four-star admirals at the time when these announcements came out. And one very wise four-star told me once said, Jim, what it really means is It's not that we're going to move 10% from the Atlantic into the Pacific. It's really about when they reduce our forces by 10%, we'll take that out of the Atlantic. And so in in essence, you've never really grown your force strength in the Pacific. And so that's really the truth of the matter is, is that we've never really substantially grown our force strength in the Pacific. Uh, Sure, we put in 2,500 Marines in Darwin. Uh, We've had a few new... uh, Uh, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance platforms that have come into the theater. We've got the Virginia class uh, nuclear fast attack submarine. But in terms of overall force structure, in terms of total numbers of ships and and aircraft and submarine, we're relatively the same we've been for the last 30 years. And so the question really becomes, uh, you know, or not question, the observation that I have is when you think about that and you think about the size of our, our force in the Pacific, and you think about how fast and how large the PLA has grown, uh, and then you look at what happened in Afghanistan, 
you, you remember that mass matters, numbers matter. The, the Taliban was able to surround uh, and take control of the whole country of Afghanistan because they had the numbers. And they were able to surround Kabul airport because they had the numbers. We withdrew our numbers. We withdrew our military presence out, uh, out of Bagram at the end of July. And now we're reaping the consequences for that. I, I heard somebody on a podcast, you know, say that, you know, General Petraeus had advised both the the Biden and Trump and previous administration, they said, if you want to get out of Afghanistan, you're still going to have to leave some some small force of people there to maintain stability. You know, he said around two, 3,000 people. And we had been doing that for the last 18 months. But when we removed those, it was a green light uh, for the Taliban. It's the same process in the Pacific. And at some point, the Chinese are going to say, I got a green light right now. Not only do I have a, an administration that appears not intent on, you know, taking action, uh, but now I have the mass, I have the numerical superiority to achieve my goals. And so this is really the, a really dangerous time. And, uh, you know, we've seen the Chinese press over the last 48 hours, 72 hours, make a lot of references to what this event in Afghanistan means for Taiwan. And even today, uh, the Global Times just put out a, a, an editorial remarking on apparently yesterday president biden made the statement that you know we made a sacred commitment to article 5 with nato and it applies also to japan south korea and even taiwan and everybody you know said what uh, you know that's never been said before by a us president and so china is now in the in the process the global times of helping defend joe biden by saying well he probably didn't know what he was saying he didn't mean it he's under a lot of stress from what's going on in Afghanistan. Because if he did, if he knew what he said, well, that would be the red line and we would change everything and we would, you know, that would be the, the reason for us to go to war to take Taiwan. So, I mean, China right now is in the catbird seat. They, they see what's happened in Afghanistan. They can see a demoralized uh, nation in many ways. 18 months of people being cowed into wearing masks at, at the whim of, of, of one person, being forced to have vaccines to be able to go into a restaurant, being forced to have their children taught bizarre uh, school curricula. That's all I can, I'll say on that. I mean, a lot of things that are just falling apart in this nation. And China sees all that. And they're seeing what they believe is an erosion of the American spirit, the American will. Uh, what we used to call in the Reagan administration, the city on the shining hill. They mock that now. They mock that thinking and say, that's all, that was all made up stuff. It was all propaganda. And you guys were never a city, on a, a, a shining city on a hill. Even though we have, you know, millions of people that have come to America because they wanted to come there to, to, to ha have that taste of freedom. And so China's using soft power and information warfare to take what's happening in America to continue to demoralize us, to continue to divide us, to continue to separate us, to continue to promote their brand internationally, and to reinforce the strength of the party inside China. And at some point, they're going to, they've told the people of Taiwan, you know, you're going to be ours, and it's going to be rather quickly. And so the question is, when does that quickly happen? And how does it happen? And what does Taiwan do? And, you know, that's really the, the, the big question is, what does Taiwan do? So, Jim, one of the questions I have about, you know, you, you watch Chinese propaganda on a pretty regular basis. Do you think that this is just their political warfare, psychological warfare stuff, where they're just trying to demoralize Taiwan, they're trying to demoralize the U.S.? Uh, and, and just to be clear, what Chinese state-run media is saying is that, hey, Taiwan, Look at how the U.S. abandoned Afghanistan. They'll abandon you when we invade, not if, once we invade. Uh, so, you know, you should probably Give strike up, a deal yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. So do you think that this is just like a psychological warfare tactic about demoralization? Or do you think that the Chinese Communist Party leadership, they honestly believe that the U.S. is, you know, on the retreat? Uh, on the way down, and that would mean that now is the time to act. 
I think if you had asked me that, okay, first of all, it's definitely an information uh, tactic. It's Sunza. It's, you know, uh, winning without fighting. It's all of that. But but they're not separated. I mean, we in the West kind of see it, well, is it non-kinetic or is it kinetic? And and it's together. It's woven together. And so it's a fabric. And it's we have to do all these things to pressurize and screw with the minds of the Taiwanese in order to get them to finally capitulate. But when they don't, we have this fabric. It's woven. And we're going to flow right into armed conflict. There's And we kind of see it as this like, if this, then then. It's a you know Greek uh, Aristotelian logic. You know, if this, then this. And I think in the Chinese mind, it's it's a tapestry, and they're moving across that tapestry. And so, how do you light that tapestry on fire and and, and cause it to not come into play? And that's really our challenge. And I think a year ago, I think they probably still were, you know, talking big, talking strong, but. Behind closed doors in Shanghai, they're probably sitting around saying, you know, they got this many carriers and they got this many nuclear boomers and they got this many submarines and they're operating here and they got these these they got the biggest air force and they can resupply and they got logistics that we don't have and blah blah blah. And they were probably not we're probably they they respect that. But I think over the last 18 months, and this is now what's happened in Afghanistan, they're gonna be am- examining all of this right now. When you hear stories about British SAS commanders in screaming matches with U.S. Army commanders about whether or not they'll go outside the wire to go get people to bring them back into the airport to rescue them, which is out in the press now this week. It's already been out there. When China, China will have that information. They'll probably have more information. They'll have signals intelligence. They'll have uh, human intelligence, they're probably soaking up and getting a real sense of what's going on inside the U.S. military right now, and at least of those people that are in Afghanistan, and judging that from other statements that are made by other military leaders. And I think you can only come to the conclusion that they're going to be more confident that the United States is weaker than it was a year and a half ago. Does that mean they think we're a pushover and that we won't respond? No. But that's why they're building, you know, 350 uh, ICBM silos out in Western China. This is the last piece. Once those silos go live, and once they have a nuclear arsenal that's at parity with the United States, things are going to dramatically change because they're not going to be pushed around anymore. And they're going to start signaling and using uh, nuclear weapons as, as a blackmail tool. They've had this no first use policy since they first tested, that's going to go away. They won't, they won't formally put it away, but you can guarantee behind uh, closed doors, they're going to remind people that you really want to screw with us when we have just as many nukes as you. And so I think this is really the, something that has alarmed me that we're not talking about this. It, it hasn't been brought up at all in this last you know, two or three months. Since, since the first reports came out in April, you know, uh, the Federation of uh, Scientists and things of those kind of specialty websites have talked about them, but it hasn't been a national issue. This administration has literally, I mean, I know Secretary of State Blinken has made a couple of comments on it, but it this building of these uh, ICBM silos and the Chinese developing a, a nuclear arsenal that's going to be on par or greater than the United States, this is, as I wrote in an, an editorial, this is the Chinese Sputnik moment. This is a this is a major event. You know, when the Russians, the Soviets launched the Sputnik satellite into space in 1957, it shocked America's intellectuals. It shocked Washington D.C. because we didn't think the Soviet Union had any any way, shape, or form could have put us a, a satellite into space before us, in, at all, let alone before us. And now here we are at this point where China's basically saying. In the space of April, May, June, July, three or four months, we now have commercial satellite imagery that shows 300 plus, 340 plus individual ICBM silos. Well, people say, well, we don't know what's really in them. They could just be drilling holes in the sand and they're just, you know, deceiving us. Okay, go ahead. Risk, risk your future on that kind of an assessment. We had assessments in the past about China's commitment to nuclear development. 
We know what the technologies that they've given to other nations. And we know that they're committed to having a strong nuclear arsenal. They've told us that in writing. And now we're seeing that manifested in action. And so this is going to dramatically change the balance of power in the world. And the, why we're not talking about it uh, is beyond comprehension to me. And after that satellite imagery of the ICBM silos came out, um, you saw the Chinese propaganda apparatus threatening to nuke Japan once they talked about defending Taiwan. So already they're pulling out that card yes. that this can be a threat. I mean, think about that. They're not even maybe not even filled with nuclear weapons at this point in time. And they're already changing the rhetoric to if you try to screw with us, we're going to nuke you. If you oppose us in any way, if you support Taiwan, we will nuke you. Wow. And that's, you haven't seen that on uh, ABC, CBS, or NBC Evening News. I saw a great story about a bear that got loose in a Ralph's. Okay. (laughs) I mean, that is big news. It It was a Ralph's. It was a Ralph. It was a tiny bear, too. Oh, a tiny bear. Mm -hmm. This is news, Chris. This is. Anyways, I've completely forgotten about what we were talking about. Nuclear war? Oh, yeah. Well, well, Jim, why do you think we're not talking about it? Well, that's another story of, I mean, where, where is America's national security, foreign policy leadership today? What, what are they focused on? So all I know is what I see, you know, coming out of the, the administration the day after the president's speech talking about Afghanistan. The next day's speech was uh, about, you know, covid And we need to have the Department of Education using everything in their power to go after states that don't that that try to keep people from wearing masks. So um, we have uh, teaching unions telling us they're not going to go back in the classroom unless children are vaccinated and wear masks or double masks. We have cities close to where you are in Philadelphia that said for government workers, if you're not vaccinated, you have to wear two masks. we have cities like New York and L.A. that say if you don't get vaccinated, you can't can't eat in a restaurant. I just saw something right before we came on in Paris. Apparently, they're now saying in some place that if you don't have a vaccination, you can't go into a grocery store. So we're focused on that kind of stuff. We're focused on, uh, you know, drag queen story hour at the library, the public library, and trans- forced transgenderism. We're, we're focused on things that are not right. And so why would anybody be concerned that China's going to have a nuclear arsenal as big as ours or bigger? <laughs> it seems incredible to say that, uh, given my lifetime and my experience and the apparatus that I worked in and existed in with thousands and millions of other, you know, American, you know, patriotic Americans that worked to defend our nation against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And we're now not paying attention to some of the most significant threats. And when things do happen and go south, like what we just saw this week, and it's still going on in Afghanistan, uh, we don't seem to be willing to get inspired. I was at a conversation with somebody today, and we were talking about, you know, America came together on December 7th, 1941, when Pearl Harbor was attacked. You all remember coming together as a nation after 9-11. I, I view what's happened in Afghanistan and these nuclear silos, we're not, we're in a it's not a one specific event. I mean, I think the fall of Afghanistan, you could say in 11, 11 hours or so, is, isn't is a single event. But is America rallying around that together? And some of the polls suggest that, you know, many, many people are very, very upset with what's going on in the high 70s, maybe high 80s or low 80s percentage wise. So that's a good sign. But what are we going to do about it? And how are we going to come together and put aside these squabbles? put aside this focus on what I consider to be non-essential, non-life-threatening issues and get back to defending the nation. Well, you mentioned this earlier, that China is building this this tapestry. And how do you light it on fire? How do you light it on fire? Well, there's a lot of things that we have to do across what this whole of government. And uh, part of it is we have to get back to serious uh, uh, assessments of what the threat is. So if we see the Chinese building a Navy and an Air Force and a strategic rocket force, and we think that we can just compete with that by 
having distributed network warfare and we'll, yeah, you can have 300 ships and we'll have 30, but we'll be able to defeat you because we have super sensors and networks. And no, that doesn't work. History has shown that doesn't work. And so until we get back to kind of uh, nuts and bolts kinds of approach of we have to have a, a strong military defense, a physical defense. That's where I initially always focus on. A lot of our colleagues that we know focus on the economic arena and that China is still economically inferior to the United States, smaller than the United States. And so that we should focus on lighting the fire in the economic arena. What the previous administration was attempting to do with sanctions and tariffs, you know, those those initial first phase tariffs were, on, were only just the first phase. They were supposed to go to a second phase if China didn't comply and China didn't comply. But are we going to a second phase? No, we have we have the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and Wall Street uh, Larry Fink at BlackRock telling, you know, the administration and Wall Street, no, you should triple down, double down, invest as much money as you have into China's markets. You know, we're, we're, we're not following through. We're not really serious about the threat. So we're going to give them millions and billions of dollars and China will take some percentage of that, 10, 12 percent of it or whatever, and pump that into continuing to build their military dominance, which will then be used to blackmail Japan, Taiwan, and other nations to kowtow to do what they say. And eventually, ultimately, all that power will be used to uh, pressurize us. So we need to get back to competing with China as a great, as, a, as not a con just a strategic competitor, but a strategic enemy. We need to look at them as a strategic enemy because they stand opposed to the values that we stand for as Americans and, 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 and those that believe in freedom and liberty. And so, we have to make sure that we're not sending all of our wealth to China. Cut the money off. Um, they need food in China. They're, they have 1.4 billion people. They don't have that much arable land compared to the amount of people that they have. So why are we selling them food without some kind of conditions? And if they don't meet those conditions, then we turn the food off. Oh, that's terrible. That's What about the poor people that aren't part of the party? That would be mean to them. Well, Guess what? When you start turning off food from people, that tends to get to the leadership's ears, as Bloomberg said, I think, several in the last year or so. When he said Xi Jinping has to listen to his constituents. Yeah. Now, I, I thought that was absurd of what Bloomberg said. But when, but in a, in a sense, if you start causing mass starvation amongst the Chinese people, they're, gonna, they're not going to sit by and tell Xi Jinping, hey, keep holding out to the United States and, and they're going to do something. So we have some room to maneuver to light that tapestry on fire. We have resources that they need, but we keep consuming. Americans keep consuming things that are bought in China. We keep pumping money back into them. We keep giving them oxygen to live and we need to take the oxygen away. We need to have a strong military. We need to have our economy uh, decoupled from China. There's other places in the world that we can get things and have things manufactured and, and sell things ourselves. And then we need to have a campaign that goes after them intellectually and talks about the, the perversion of their belief system, the, the, the evil of communism and what communism has wrought over the years and what it ultimately leads to. And we don't do a good job of that. We don't tackle that. The previous administration was getting around to it. Secretary Pompeo's speech at the Nixon Library was a really good attempt. And the vice president and others were making speeches. But it has to be a national campaign. It has to be a national effort in our schools to teach our own children about it. When I see polls that say that American, American youth think that socialism or communism isn't that bad, I have to ask myself, where have we gone wrong in our school system? that we can allow that to percolate up over the years. Well, the last piece, just to frame it out, would be in obviously in a diplomatic arena. We have to work with our allies. We have to be close with our allies. And I know this is an area where the previous administration took a lot of hit for America first and all that. And, and I got it. I understand that people didn't like that. But look what just happened in Afghanistan. We just pulled out and it was a NATO fighting force there. And we didn't even inform NATO. So for all the all the accusations and all the scorn and all the endless attacks that we saw for four years about how the, the, the orange man and his tweets were you know, upsetting NATO, 
Did we ever do anything like this during those four years? Did we ever take a military maneuver without consultation? Did we shut down travel because of COVID? Sure, okay. Yeah, there's some things that happen. But in something this fundamental, I mean, regardless of whatever happened with Trump, the idea that you would take a maneuver and pull military forces out that are part of a NATO uh, fighting force without informing NATO is, is shocking. It's absolutely incomprehensible. Not just, I'm not talking about the president. I'm talking about the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State. I mean, these people are all supposedly experts. They're the best of the best, the most educated, have the best resumes, have been around and doing these things for so long, they have all the Rolodexes and have all the connections, and they didn't make those calls. It's hard, to, it's hard, it's incomprehensible. And it's devastating to America's credibility. So how do you light a fire on a tapestry that's been soaked in water for you know three or four weeks and you get one match? That's kind of where I feel like we're at right now. That tapestry is soaking wet and we're going to try to light it on fire. It's going to be really, really hard. You know, there's an interesting argument that I've seen some people making about credibility, which you just mentioned that this Afghanistan thing uh, harmed the U.S.'s credibility. And there's this idea that credibility or reputational credibility isn't real. Like there was a famously a Vox article from a few years ago that talked about this uh, called the credibility trap, where they were basically making the argument that, you know, political scientists have shown that reputational credibility isn't actually something that allies and um, enemies of the U.S. base their de uh, decisions on. But I thought you might have a different you know, uh, perspective on that. No, I, I've, 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 I've read this and I, and I, I don't disagree in, in a sense. I mean, nations take decisions based on their own self-interest. So the question is, if I'm a partner with you, uh, you're not going to say, well, Jim Fennell is credible. So I'll, I'll go along with what he's suggesting. You're going to say, Jim Fennell can help me in this area because Matt's going to hit me with a hammer and, and Jim's going to come in and grab the hammer out of his hand because I'm seeing him physically moving there to take the hammer out of Matt's hand. When you see that and understand that and watch me move, then you're going to say, you don't say it's credibility, you understand what it is. And so I'm not suggesting the, it, the term credibility can be used in a, in a kind of a theoretical academic sense. And I'm really talking about in a real sense. You know, when you talk to Grant Newsham, he's, the, you know, he's always very specific about the kinds of practical things that the Japanese self-defense force and the United States military in the Western Pacific should be doing together. That's the kind of credibility that matters when you're actually physically together and you're actually have common radios and common frequencies and common tactics, techniques and procedures. And, and, and you have command structures where you're sitting side by side and you're, you're commanding both forces together to make sure that you can deal with a situation like in the Senkaku. Um, that is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. But that, that, that's set, that relationship is set in a sense with some diplomatic overtures. And so we have to have, you know, we call it the dime, the diplomatic information, military economics. So I had kind of explained military information, economic and, and diplomacy was my last point. I don't know. They're not in any order. China calls it comprehensive national power, but it's this whole of government approach to say that if you think somebody's an enemy, you're going to do everything in your power uh, to uh, stop them from hurting you. Because an enemy, by definition, somebody that wants to hurt you. And see, this is where we don't, I don't think, we don't ever think of China that way. I mean, I do, but I don't think most people do, especially most elites in our government do not. I don't think Secretary of State Blinken actually think China wants to hurt us. I never heard him say it. Yesterday, John Kirby was asked, is the Taliban uh, an enemy of the United States? And he couldn't say it. Now, maybe he couldn't say it because we have 10,000 hostages there. I'll give him a break there. But my point is, we have a tendency to be, uh, as Americans, uh, unwilling to call somebody an enemy. I don't know when that became a problem. We didn't have that problem in World War II. We didn't have that problem in the Korean War. We didn't even have a problem in Vietnam, uh, and we haven't had it in some circles in Afghanistan, Iraq, but 
more and more we seem to be unwilling to say that's a that's an imminent threat and we have to neutralize it or deal with it. And so until we can recognize that the Chinese Communist Party intends harm, intends to inflict damage and hurt on the United States of America, maybe we're never going to react. Once we wake up to that, then it makes it easier for people, uh, I think, to come behind a movement that confronts them. Well, it seems like in Washington, um, there's a real fear of what the Chinese Communist Party calls a Cold War mentality. It seems like there's a real resistance to taking things back to the Cold War, when in reality, the Cold War never ended. Right. I mean, you have the, the you know, this famous uh, uh, book by Graham Allison, The Thucydides Trap, and there's this people in this, this genre, that or this cadre of people, I call them, that they put out this idea that we have to engage, we have to engage, because if we don't engage, then we go into this Cold War mindset and then it, all it takes is one unintended event and it will spark a nuclear holocaust. And so they, they, they just have this logic train that goes from we have to engage to nuclear, thermonuclear war in like 10 seconds. And yet every other challenge that we get involved with, like Afghanistan or like Iraq or, or wherever it is, or dealing with NATO or dealing with Russia, they're always talking about off ramps and you know, confidence building measures and shades of gray. So we, we, we have this uh, mindset where we can see shades of gray in other areas, but when it comes to the PRC, it's black and white. Either we're engaged in, in appeasing with them or it's, it's nuclear war. And, and you're like, well, what happened between all those, you know, the Grand Canyon between those two extremes? Aren't there areas where we can, uh, you know, uh, chip away at their strength and power? And their ability to hurt us, and so Cold War mentality gets thrown out. It's a it's a psychological information warfare tool to try to neutralize uh, American uh, elitist liberal thinkers that uh, want to say, "Oh, we can't go into a Cold War because the last Cold War was very damaging and 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 you know not good for us." It's very hard right now. I have to be honest. It's very hard to watch what's going on and not get you know somewhat depressed about where we're heading as a nation. And then I uh, listened to a little clip, uh, this uh, former SEAL, uh, Marcus Luttrell. I don't know if you saw that clip that was on television yesterday. It was on Fox. And uh, he was asked by the announcer, what, what should we do then, you know, with the situation in Afghanistan? And he's, he, 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 unlike the, what I've just done and discussed with you, he didn't criticize the administration. He just said, I'm not going to do that. What, what we need to do is we need to be Americans and we need to go get them. Because we can do this. That's what we do. And so I had forgotten that. I've been out of uniform for a while. We're Americans. This is what we do. China's a threat. China wants to hurt us. China wants to control the world and make America become subservient to it. Yes. Okay. That's a threat. Do they, are they building nuclear missiles? Yes. Are they manipulating the Taliban to our disadvantage? Yes. Are they threatening Taiwan? Yes. All of that. But does that mean we give up and go home? No. We're Americans, and if we come together, we can push them back because what they stand for is inferior in, in to what we believe in, and it's always been that way. And people want to be free, and people want liberty, and they want fairness, and they want equality. They want to believe that every person is equal, and China does not believe that. They don't believe everyone's equal. You said that earlier, Matt. They don't care about one individual. There's mouse in. We can let we can go to nuclear war. We'll still have a lot of people left over. Okay. They don't care about that. And that's reflected in the policies and procedures that they implement on their people. And I know that China's got a lot of money now and people are better off than they were uh, 30 years ago when Ding opened up. But the fact of the matter is those people aren't free. And they are being told where they can go, what they can do what buildings they can enter, what buildings they can't, what crosswalks that they can go across. And they're being scrutinized and watched and they don't really have freedom. We do. We still have it. And we don't have to give up on it. And if we come together with like-minded people, we can make a change. So it's not over. Now, there's the optimistic ending I was hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim, thank you for joining us and thank you for 
reminding us that we are all Americans. And we can be that we can light this baby on fire. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks. And I really appreciate it. And we are Americans and we do have a chance to stand up and take our nation back in a peaceful way domestically, in a violent way if we have to internationally. Great. Yeah. Once again, Jim, thanks for joining us. It's always a, a nightmarish pleasure to have you on. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Yeah, that was that was a fantastically optimistic way to end it. Like you made a good point. Like we need to say who our enemies are, and so I am proud to finally just come out and say, Matt, <laughs> you are my enemy. I was wondering if it was going to be me I, or Matt. Yeah, like, I was I also was like wondering 50, 50 that. Chance. I choose enemies that I'm not afraid of. <laughs> also, I'm the enemy that's further away from you right now. So yes, I can true. do. Strategic. Shelly could, could reach out and hit so you. So you were going to use me as a buffer state? Yes, what? you're my buffer state. You're my, you're, can, can, Shelly, you're my Afghanistan. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of layers to that. Oh, yeah. my God. A lot, a lot. All right. I think now it's time to wrap it up. <laughs> Wait, so if I'm Afghanistan, who are you? Are China. You China? I'm China. Oh, so, so, Matt's so, I'm Russia? A, so I'm America. No, Matt's no. I'm Afghanistan, Captain America. No, Captain America. Afghanistan is a buffer state between Captain America and China. Shelly really is Afghanistan. Like you just wouldn't listen to her no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thanks for watching China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chapel. I'm Shelly Jung. And I'm Matt Ganesha, America. We'll talk to you next time.